were able to relate to Jesus in a way that the male apostles didn't because they had a greater affinity to the divine mother spirit who is the mother of our universe and is the representation of the feminine energies to, to humanity. I think it is very important to remember that Jesus spoke to the soul of the individual. Christianity later evolved into a certain set of precepts. Love is a magnet. And when you're in that magnetism, it's palpable. You can feel it from other people. When you're around a person who's, who feels happy, you know, you feel happy. What I would say, being influenced by external spiritual uh, mm -hmm. influences to being influenced by our internal spiritual um, uh, wiring and, and the connections we have to our divine sources. And we have a right to do that. That is part of our divine birthright. Welcome to Inside Personal Growth Podcast. Deep dive with us as we unlock the secrets to personal development, empowering you to thrive. Here, growth isn't just a goal, it's a journey. Tune in, transform, and take your life to the next level by listening to just one of our podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And we have a guest joining us from Florida. And Donna, this is her book. It is called The Women Who Love Jesus. And the uh, subtitle is The Untold Story of Women's Evangelist Corpse. Good day to you, Donna. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on your program, Greg. It's good to be And we got connected through Brian Belitos. And Brian is someone who has been on the show many times. And we'll put a link because he just did an interview on his book around Urantia. And that's what this is all about. Donna is a lifelong student of the Urantia book and one of the first full-time ministers of the expanded gospel of Jesus uh, based upon the Urantia revelation. She's a renowned pioneer in celestial contact. She is also the founder and executive director of her website, which you can go to, and it's called the Institute of Christ Consciousness. In addition to an extensive spiritual healing and counseling ministry, she conducts workshops and center for seminars and hosts popular online sessions each week in which she leads groups in workshop prayer and global healing. Um, she also has other books, one called Teach Us to Love. Uh, that was a one done in 2011, Divine Mother, Divine Father, 2016, and The Women Who Love Jesus, which was done last year. And that's the book that we will put a link the Amazon about. Well, thank you for being on. Oh, my pleasure. Very excited to be with your listening audience today. Well, we hope that based on um, the work of the Aracha that we've already profiled here at the website, that we'll just do a little bit more and see how many people. She's got a nice labyrinth behind her. Actually, I don't think that's a real labyrinth. It's a picture of a labyrinth, but it's there. It's actually a real labyrinth. And well, it's, it's a real labyrinth, but it's just a picture <laughs> behind the screen, right? Right, now, right. right. And, yeah, you know, it's not mine. I did not create it, unfortunately. <laughs> but she's in Delray Beach, Florida. So that looks like it could be because it looks like there's kind of a little inlet of water right there behind it, right? On a beautiful lake. This is actually a place up in Minnesota where the labyrinth is. Ah, well... There's a lot of very spiritual people in Minnesota. I've been there and spent time with them. So look, the women in this book played significant roles uh, in Jesus's ministry and the history often is overlooked. Um, many of my listeners already know about the Urantia book and the work of the Urantia, but obviously you want to weave it into this so that they understand where you're coming from. How did you first come across these accounts and what was your initial reaction, you know, kind of to their stories? Because this is really about the women who love Jesus uh, and, and specifically. Yeah. 
My first contact with the women began in December of 1999. I was meeting with the two with two friends who were also Urantia book readers, two ladies who were also interested in healing as I was. And as we were discussing, I had a very strong mental image uh, of 12 women garbed in luminous ancient clothing in my mind's eye. And I told my friends what I was seeing, and I got the impression that they were the um, the 12 women evangelists that Jesus commissioned to be his female apostles. And as I told them about that, I felt like they were encouraging us to develop a, a healing core or healing ministry. And then as I told my friends what I was seeing, Jesus appeared behind the 12 women with his hands outstretched, <laughs> with each woman lined up between his hands, and they were just radiating down upon us this love and encouragement to do this uh, type of ministry. And I told my friends what I was experiencing, and we were just hugging and crying. It was very emotional because we could feel their love and, and their encouragement. So I never was able to really get something started with these two uh, friends. And fast forward to, um, to November of 2010 when I made the shift, because that happened when I was in the Bay Area of California, and I moved to Delray, Florida. And then they came back to me when I was conducting a meditation, and they said, we want to talk to you. We want you to start a, a healing ministry again. And so that night when I went into further meditation, they started telling me more about who they were, especially the fact that they were able to relate to Jesus in a way that the male apostles didn't because they had a greater affinity to the Divine Mother Spirit, who is the mother of our universe and is the representation of the feminine energies to, to humanity. And they also talked about how they formed a social fabric in their healing ministry where they ministered to women and children, the infirm and the elderly in such a state of love and grace that Jesus was able to convey to them that it formed a social network of great love, which began to form into the later developing Christian religion. They did not know it at the time that that's what was being birthed by their ministry, but it was very different because the men were the preachers and the teachers, but the women were the healers. Mm -hmm. So, so I this came this came to you, Donna, in meditation in the nineties, the late nineties. The right? first contact, yeah. the first, and then you shared it with groups of women, and then from there you've continued to convey this message out to the world which then ultimately ended up in this book right? Uh, it, it, you've recently written. Would that be a, a true statement? Uh, it Partially. I had a women's healing group for seven years where I had a group of women. We were meeting uh, on the phone regularly, and we were working with the women. And then that ended in 2017, and they came back to me in 2018, and they said, we want you to tell our story. And that's when I went into meditation. A friend held space for me. And for the next year, uh, between March 2019 and March 2020, that's when I got all of their stories. And uh, oh, okay. COVID hit. And so everything went flat. And then it was, um, <clears throat> it was, yeah, after COVID, they said, okay, it's time to pick the book up again. And that's when uh, I gave it to my editor. Byron Balitzos, uh, and then he 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 put it together for me, and and then it was yeah. Published. So Byron would be a, a, a actually the best source you could probably go to to put a book like this together, considering his background. And you know, you say in this story of is it Agamemnon? Agamemnon. Uh, Agamemnon. Um, what significance does Agamemnon uh, attribute to the way Jesus interacted with women, especially? compared to her previous experiences. Now, many people, I think you should put some co uh, context. You're speaking with a pretty broad brush audience. Um, they might not know who Agamemnon is. Um, they don't have your book at this particular point to make a reference to. 
So I think it's really important for you to put some context around that. <clears throat> Aldaman was married and she was uh, a widow. And in her tradition, she had a certain a circumscribed role to play. When she encountered Jesus, it was like, and, and this was pretty much the same experience for all of them, it was like his soul touched them in a way that it helped them step outside their conditioned uh, boundaries imposed on them by their culture. And this is something that struck at their core of their who they were, their soul. And it helped them open up to who they really were as daughters of God to strike out on a different path that was quite, quite astonishing for women at that time because women were relegated to second-class citizenship. And Jesus was able to strip all of that away and say to the public, women are equal in the eyes of God with men, and women have the right to be ministers of the gospel. And so for Agamon, that was a big life-changing experience for her, especially at a uh, an age when she was probably just, you know, ready to move into the role of grandmother, but she took on a much larger role of moving into his healing ministry to minister to and help heal many other people who were ready to hear his message of spiritual liberation. Interesting. I, I, an off the wall kind of question for you, and I'm sure you've got an answer for this. How is it that in our today's world, today meaning right now, um, we have this very strong Christian group that's in support of, support of one candidate, so we're saying Christian, and we have another segment of the population which obviously is very concerned about women's rights, so we're now speaking about women. How, what, how would you, Donna, actually um, conflate that and, and look at that? I think it is very important to remember that Jesus spoke to the soul of the individual. Christianity later evolved into a certain set of precepts, dogma, traditions, and rituals about his life. And for me, in my own relationship with Jesus, he really brought me back to my authentic self. And so in my own life, I developed more of a personal relationship with him and my higher self that serves as a moral compass. And I, I think what we're seeing in our political culture is that there are some very um, lines of divisiveness. And I don't think that that is part of Jesus' gospel. I think he is here to unify people in the fact that we are all going to have different opinions and values based on our life experiences, but where we can share a unified sense is that we are all sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters in a loving family. And even though we may disagree with one another, we still are being called to overlook all of the differences that we have and find our commonality, which is at the spiritual level. I think that's a, that's a really good way to put that. Now, of these 12 women, you know, when you go through, I think you need to give some context to uh, our listening audience because you've got Joanna, you've got all of these different women in a chapter pretty much dedicated, uh, Martha to each one, right? Um, and so I, I think as you've written this, they obviously there's obviously a story around each one of them. But who are they? Um, and tell our listeners, really give them some context for this women's evangelist core. Okay. Um, during Jesus' public ministry, he went out around the whole region of uh, what is now present-day Israel, uh, Syria, uh, probably even into Lebanon, uh, there is a great uh, account in the Urantia book about all of his public teachings and where he went. So he always amassed a group of people who were interested in, in what he was saying because it was so 
different from the traditional or uh, uh, religious uh, Jewish approach to uh, to spirituality and religion. So people would come out to hear him. And the women would be the same. They had the same level of curiosity. So they would come out to hear him. And it was like he drew people not from just a um, all the different walks of life. It was just like he was speaking to a part of them, a part of each person. And today he still, still speaks to that same part of us. It's our soul. And he had such a he evoked such a strong soul response in each one of them that it got them thinking. It got them to open up to their higher spiritual potential. Um, one of the women, Kelta, was the daughter of a Roman centurion. She actually left her family. She was in, in the role of being trained as a Roman uh, housewife, if you will, a Roman mother. She completely left that to, to follow Jesus. Uh, some of the uh, women were attached to the uh, male apostle families. Um, Martha was the sister of the apostles um, Simon and uh, Simon Peter and Andrew. And Milka was the cousin of Thomas Didymus, Thomas the Doubting Thomas. And um, uh, Ruth was the daughter of Matthew Levi. So uh, they, they all had some type of connection to him. But the most important thing was when they heard him speak, what they told me was it was like their, his words had energy and it just pushed through some level of their consciousness to strike a chord in them that was so deep that made them want to follow him and devote their lives to, to public ministry. And I, I, I remember when they were transmitting their stories to me in meditation that I could feel their emotions. I could feel their love for Jesus and his love for them. And it still moves me almost to tears today because it's so beautiful, especially to give these women a sense of their own divine dignity, which their culture did not allow them to experience. And I think that that's still true today in, in the 21st century that he will instill within each person that sense of divine dignity that says, yes, you have a right to be who you are. Yes, you have a right to develop your soul purpose. Yes, you have a right to be validated as a human. And, and, and that is something that I think is going to carry forth, you know, 2,000 years ago all the way into the future. So that was really remarkable that what he did well, for them. I, I would agree with you. And I think that, you know, it, women, uh, obviously, and from the times that these women were there with Jesus to today, uh, so much has happened. But you, you took these stories from these women. And one of them I'm going to use, I'll just hold it up here. It's Rachel. Okay. And you've got lovely pictures of these women at each one of the chapters. Um, and I want to know what in Rachel's case, how, um, and how were they applied, these healing techniques that she learned? And then how did they influence um, and basically applied, I'm sorry, how did she learn these healing techniques and how did she apply them to early Christianity community? Because I was just reading here how oh, she was doing that. And for my listeners, here's this is Rachel. So can you give us a little bit of um, insight into Rachel? Yes. Uh, Rachel was actually the sister-in-law of Jesus's human brother, Jude. Jesus had many brothers and sisters. And um, Rachel became attached to, to Jesus uh, through her soul opening and awakening. And keep in mind that Jesus was a love magnet. He exuded such a spiritual fragrance that if people were open to that, they were just drawn to him. And so what he taught them, and, and this is true for all of them, the quality of faith that precedes healing. To have, he was so loving and compassionate and concerned for the plight of humanity 
that there was a certain kind of empathy bond that grew up between Jesus and the people to whom he ministered that the women were able to actually absorb. It's an energy you can absorb. You can imprint upon that, just like a baby imprints upon the love of his and her parents. It's the same principle. Jesus was so radiant of, of this quality we call unconditional love, perfect love, perfect understanding of the individual. And he was able to help the women grow in that capacity. So when they were in their encampment following Jesus, there were many people who flocked to that encampment and they needed healing. You know, there were many maladies of, the, of that day. And, you know, you know the, of course, the medical science wasn't as sophisticated as it is now, but they were very well trained in the uh, application of healing uh, herbs and essential oils. But there was another ingredient that Jesus was able to invoke in them, and that was that quality of love, which heals everything. And they became so successful in that, that they drew other people. Love is a magnet. And when you're in that magnetism, it's palpable. You can feel it from other people. When you're around a person who's, who feels happy, you know, you feel happy. It's the same thing with love. So over time, what it started to do was draw other women into the encampment, and they started to train other women to be healers and ministers of the gospel of love, not necessarily the gospel of dogma that, re that later developed in Christianity, but the purity of love and faith that you can be healed, you can be made well and whole. And that environment formed what you might call the social network of the early evolving Christian church. Now, it did not get into, and, and they did not go into that part of the, the, what the males played because there's you know, enough historic record, but they wanted their story to be told because this is a missing ingredient of how they were able to work through and with the Holy Divine Mother Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who heals, who is the healing presence for us. And Jesus taught them how to uh, connect with the Holy Mother Spirit and, and help them remember that their femininity is a gift from God. And it has there, they were the they they were in essence the silent majority, but we had such a patriarchal society then that uh, the matriarchal society, which is still evolving actually, um, is here today and the women's role in that. And I think this book is as much for anybody that wants to learn about the evangelistic core and the roles that these women played, but also how it has formed even kind of where we are today from a different viewpoint of Christianity. I mean, that's in essence what you're saying. The dogma Christianity is not the one. And if somebody is actually studying the Urantia book, they're going to realize that because as we said, as Byron told me, it's the reboot of the of the testament. Um, he calls it the reboot, and so is this, right? It in in essence is. So look, most people out there can relate to Mary Magdalene. Some most of them are, know her. Um, what was her first impression of Jesus, and how did it affect her spiritual path? She had had a hard life up to the time when she met Jesus, and she was brought before Jesus by two of the women who went into uh, the place where she was working in, in a brothel, and she had such an immediate response to Jesus. Um, <laughs> she said in her book that she completely fell apart when she when she was before him because it was like all of her s sins just came crushing, rushing at her and, and just kind of, she had an emotional breakdown. But what Jesus was able to do was kind of like glue the bits of her psyche back together and, and heal her in a way that all that baggage was gone. It was gone. And, and he gave her this sense of her divine dignity and, and self-worth, which everyone needs to experience. Well, I love your I love your little quote, not to interrupt here, but the quote underneath her picture is, 
We are hoping to rectify the past and especially to end the male domination that has long persisted within the church. Uh, I think that's a very appropriate. And um, you're saying that she felt immediately healed when being able to meet Jesus, right, from all those sins that she had in her life. And that was really the biggest uh, effect to her spiritually ever in her life, right? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems to be from the stories. Um, so I'm going to pick another one, and it's Ruth. Um, how did Ruth's appreciation for Divine Mother deepen during her time with the Women's Corps, and how did this influence her ministry? And while you are speaking, I'm going to pull Ruth's picture up here. Here it is for everybody. There you go. Um, so all these chapters and under hers, it says, even though Jesus was male in body and appearance, he appealed to me beyond gender. His out understanding of women was quite astonishing. So any comment about Ruth and her awakening as a result of her interaction with Jesus? Well, for Ruth, I think what was most interesting for her growing up in a very patriarchal religion, and even though her father was an apostle, he still carried some of that residual uh, male chauvinism, if you want to use that word, or, you know, that... that, that dominance. Dominance, you know, and, and in, in Jesus, she found that that just wasn't there. It was like, who is this guy? Why doesn't he have that? You know, <laughs> it was so unusual. And and you know, some women are are very feminine, and they're very much um, what you might say wired to the Holy Mother, Divine Spirit, that sense of compassion and holding space for others and providing a loving space for people. And I think that that's what he was able to evoke in her because he was this huge energy he was he had he lived in an energy field of pure love and when you're around person like that it can expand your own capacities and she just had this you know tremendous capacity to love that that is you know just for a lot of people just a natural part of their uh, human personality and I think for her that he he just really resonated that so strongly that she could feel that and and develop a, a much greater affinity to the Holy Mother Spirit and become a great healer in that way. Well, I would like to reflect on the fact that most spiritual leaders that hold that essence of pure love, let's just say the Dalai Lama, uh, or, you know, I could go on with the list. Um, but the reality is, is that there is something quite different when you meet them, when you experience them, um, their essence, their presence, their energy, their light field, right? And obviously Jesus was the was the greatest one of all time. Um, but we have had many since then um, that have come down the path and um, many of, of them which I've respected, whether it's Eastern or Western philosophy, um, they are out there, and um, so it is. It is. It is an interesting thing that these twelve women, who were loved by Jesus unconditionally, told a story of letting people know that that unconditional love is what changed them forever in their life, both about how they were in the world, who they were to the world, and what they gave to the world. And for those listeners out there who want to. Um, this, you want to go, the Arantia book, look it up, but this is the women uh, who loved Jesus, and get a copy of this. So if there's one takeaway, Donna, that you want readers to remember of the women who loved Jesus, or two, or three, what would you want to actually tell listeners today? Because you have groups that meet, uh, people can go to your website, which again, I'm going to voice the website. It's institutechristconsciousness.org. There you can learn more about Donner, the path of spiritual growth. 
Um, there's one awaken to the path, the stillness practice, uh, growing in Jesus consciousness, uh, the faith adventure. Um, there's lots of things. There's a video series there as well. You can look at the video series. There's books and CDs and MP3s. And again, there's free offerings as well for everybody. So do go to that. Look for their events. Um, go there and learn more about this book. But what are the three things you'd like people to take away? The first thing I like to reinforce is that Jesus taught a very simple gospel, and it was this, faith in the creator of all and loving service to the family of humanity. It's that simple. And it is time for us to get back to that very simple gospel of loving one another, appreciating one another, and, and recognizing that every person has value just because he and she is a child of a loving creator. The second thing I'd like to emphasize is the relationship to the Divine Mother Holy Spirit, that the presence of the Divine Feminine is a placeholder for us to grow in who we are. It's a loving environment. It's a safe environment. Many people don't feel safe in the world right now, and for good reason, because it is a scary place. But when you open up to the Holy Spirit, she provides an expansion in human consciousness of her presence where you can begin to take a breath, and begin to feel relaxed and begin to feel more peaceful and safe and secure. Because now what's happening with our Divine Mother, who is the womb of our consciousness, human thought and emotion is elevating out of the din of our planetary mind and elevating into a broader, larger context of the universe where things are orderly, where life is organized and orderly and peaceful. And that is a huge step for people to take in their spiritual development. And then the third uh, very important is uh, to open up your relationship to Jesus. We have a direct relationship to him through the spirit of truth, which he endowed to all of the world during Pentecost. And during Pentecost, there was this infusion of spiritual energy that elevated both the male and the female apostles to go out into the world and to minister the gospel message. Now, we know that later Christianity became very dogmatized, but going back to the original gospel and opening up to a relationship with Jesus just validates a person at the core level of their being of the right to be who they are and to embark on the wonderful journey of growing your own soul. So those three things I think are the most important component that I'd like readers to take away from this book. And we're moving away from what I would say being influenced by external spiritual uh, mm -hmm. influences to being influenced by our internal spiritual um uh, wiring and and the connections we have to our divine sources. And we have a right to do that. That is part of our divine birthright. And now the planetary circuits are being cleared of a lot of the morass that has kept us stuck, has kept us in these bonds of spiritual enslavement so we can rise above the past, like Byron says, a reboot, and get into the higher dimensions of reality where we have so much better information to feed our minds with love and truth and peace and goodness. And these are some of the things that Jesus provides to us as a living source through our spirit of truth. Well, that was very well put. And I think people ought to go and read the Spiritual Bill of Rights at your website or Humanity. Um, the way that you just put that uh, really outlined those seven spiritual rights of humanity. Um, so for all of our listeners, go check that out, the website. It's under resources, uh, and it's a spiritual bill of rights for humanity. Proclaim liberty to spiritual captives uh, by Teresa Marks. Very well put. Well, thanks for being on Inside Personal Growth and 
spending a little bit of time with our listeners, speaking about your book. And I know that those who are interested in Urantia and interested in uh, these women spiritual, the evangelists, or I should say the core, uh, they definitely should go pick up a copy of your book. Thank you so much, Donna, for being in Inside Personal Growth. Thank you so much, Greg. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast on Inside Personal Growth. We appreciate your support. And for more information about new podcasts, please go to InsidePersonalGrowth.com or any of your favorite channels to listen to our podcast. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.